My name is Michael Buckland, and I'm at the University of California, Berkeley. Mostly I worked in university libraries, and then I taught, and then I retired, and now I just get involved with fun projects. My colleague is Ryan Shaw, who was a software developer, uh, who came to my school in Berkeley and became interested in what on earth is a historical event and what would you do with it uh, in terms of software. And uh, he is the chief scientist on this project. And I will provide just a brief introduction to the project and then the meat of the presentation will be by Ryan. And then after, the, after that, uh, we'll talk briefly about what we plan to do next. And I hope there'll be some time for question and answer. We should acknowledge that the work is funded by the Mellon Foundation, primarily with some help from the Coleman Fung Foundation. Now, scholarly annotated editions of historically important texts are a major resource in the humanities. They're needed for all kinds of purposes. They're very hard to prepare. It takes a lot of highly specialized expertise over a long period of time. They're expensive to produce, they're difficult to fund, and the work practices are still deeply constrained by the mentality of the print-on-paper codex. That's the context. We became uh, involved with the Emma Goldman Papers project. Emma Goldman was a notorious anarchist 100 years ago barnstorming across the United States giving inflammatory speeches, a charismatic figure. And the more we learned about the circumstances under which the editors prepared their material, uh, the more appalled we were. The way it works is like this. The editor finds an interesting letter addressed to Emma Goldman, and it's signed perhaps by Fred Schmidt. The first question is, who was Fred Schmidt? And probably that was not his real name because the anarchists that she corresponded with didn't want to get deported, so they used pseudonyms. So who was Fred Schmidt really? And what was interesting about him? And what was his connection to Emma Goldman? And in the second paragraph, it refers to the recent happy event. Was that somebody's baby or was that the blowing up of the LA Times building? These are the questions that the, edit the editors have to figure out and they prepare lots of notes. Ultimately, they prepare a detailed explanatory footnote that makes the letter meaningful for the reader. A Couple of years later, they get out a wheelbarrow, they take the manuscript of the next volume down to the university press. The university press says, wonderful. But you can't have that many pages. You just take the footnotes out and we'll publish without them. Uh, it's known as return on investment. Meanwhile, in New York City, uh, the editors of the Margaret Sanger papers are doing their work. Now, Margaret Sanger, the uh, uh, advocate for women's rights and birth control, moved in a similar social circle to Emma Goldman. They knew each other, and it's quite likely that they have a letter from Fred Schmidt. So their question is, well, who's Fred Schmidt? They don't know the people at Berkeley have already been working on this, and who was he really, and what's his connection to Margaret Sanger, and why is he interesting, and this sort of thing. Two years later, they get out a wheelbarrow, they take the manuscript for the next volume to the university press, and the press says, wonderful, too many pages, take the footnotes out. You get the picture. Uh, multiple duplicative research wasted. So we, we came up with a really, really basic uh, technological fix. So when their aged desktops had warmed up and their obsolete version of WordPerfect had loaded and they wrote their notes, save as HTML, then carry on as normal. Hang it on a website, it's immediately available in full for free for anybody. That was the basic idea. Now, a lot more has been done than simply that, but that is the fulcrum upon which everything else follows. As it happened, none of them had a suitable website for putting the stuff on and we built a website for them that they could share. And then uh, last August, without any announcement, we simply removed the passport, password control so that anybody could see it. Not everybody could change the stuff, 
or add to it, but anybody could see it. And within a month, people from all around the world were using it. Uh, it had been indexed by Google and Yahoo and so on. Now, I won't say it was getting very much use, but it was really cool to see this actually happen. It was what was meant to happen, but it actually did. And so now I'll ask Ryan to uh, get into the substance of what happened. All right, thanks. So uh, <clears throat> Michael gave you a little bit of the background on, on what documentary editing is. Uh, I'll just uh, illustrate a little bit of what, of what he was saying. Uh, and then I'll describe the, the current state of editor's notes after the, the past two and a half years of us uh, working on it. Um, then the second part of the talk will be talking, I'll be talking about uh, what we're looking to do going forward. Um, so we just received uh, new funding, so we'll be working on this for at least another two years. Um, one of the things I'll be focusing on is our plans to uh, exploit linked data, so consuming linked data um, rather than just producing it. Um, and also some of our ideas about what we call hibernating scholarship that, uh, that Michael will explain a little bit at the end. So the first part of the talk is kind of the, what we've done so far, and the second part is uh, things that we plan to do. Um, so Michael mentioned uh, the, the context in which we're working, which is documentary editing. Uh, editors prepare these collections of documents like letters and articles and diaries. Um, and they produce these printed volumes in which they try to provide context for these historical documents. So the typical workflow in a project like this is that they gather documents uh, from various sources, various uh, archives. Um, the particular uh, scholars that we work with and working in this area of radical history where many, many times these documents are not actually in uh, official institutional archives but have actually been uh, collected and maintained by activists and people sort of uh, uh, on the fringes. Um, they select particular items that they tr want to try to contextualize. They publish the final product in the, term, in, uh, the, the shape of these documentary editions, uh, and then they repeat as funding al allows. And many of these projects uh, have been going on for, for decades. Um, so just as one example, the Emma Goldman papers, this is their final product is a page from, uh, from one of the edited volumes. We see a, uh, a letter here uh, from Emma Goldman and footnotes at the bottom explaining the references and names and so on. This is the output of that process. The input is boxes and boxes of documents, uh, file folders and, uh, and cabinets. Um, also, a lot of digital notes, including stacks and stacks of old uh, floppy disks with uh, Fox Pro databases and, and whatnot on it. Um, even uh, old tape backup of some of the early, early days of the project. Um, and these days also uh, the, the shared uh, file directories and so on that they, that they contribute to and take their notes. Um, and a lot of the work is, uh, uh, a lot of the communication happens uh, like this. So this is a, an image of a note written from uh, one of the editors of the Emma Golden Papers to the, the student research assistant who was working for him. It says, Patrick uh, Lennon, had any of his family members besides his brother been imprisoned? Uh, what was the book he had written on political economy that was used in Russian universities? Uh, and then a reference to, uh, he thinks it was the New York Evening Post uh, editorial that um, presumably Lenin had written in 1918 on the IWW verdict. Hard to tell if that was actually related to the other things or, or not, but this is the note that Patrick got. Um, Patrick then took this, uh, went into the archives, went to the library, trying to answer these questions, um, and typed up his notes. Uh, including the sources he had consulted. Um, this may have been in a Word document, it could be in a yellow notebook, it could be in an email that uh, the research assistant sent back. Uh, in this case, he reached a negative conclusion to the question that the editor asked, um, but nobody's ever gonna know unless they happen to be going, you know, break into the Emma Goldman office and happen to be going through that box and find this document, um, because 
In this case, because it was a, a negative answer to that question, it's not the kind of thing that's going to go into a footnote, which generally contains some sort of positive information about uh, something that was referenced in a, in a document. Um, so when we first started this project, we were interested in, in addressing a number of problems. Um, that the, the published volumes and the work that goes into producing them is very expensive. And, uh, and funding these projects is, uh, is difficult. Um, and there was a lot of great research that was being done that was not ending up in those volumes. So could, the, could there be better return on investment uh, by making more of this, uh, the, the product of these projects, uh, more widely available? Um, there's a lack of space for all the footnotes that they would potentially like, all the contextualization they would like to put into these volumes. Um, that if it was made available online, uh, we that wouldn't be an issue. Um, much of the research done is glossed over or, or not included at all. Um, whether that's fact checking, uh, especially this kind of falsification or dead ends. Um, you know, it's often useful information to know what was not uh, found despite looking in a number of different archives and yet that's not the kind of thing that would get included in an edited volume. Um, <clears throat> tangential biographical details that may, have be interest, may be of interest to someone but are not the core focus of the, the editing project but are something that they turned up while researching something else. Um, and then the preservation and legacy of these projects. So if you have uh, very skilled scholars working for 30 years. It's kind of a shame um, that if the, if the edited volumes are all that's, that's left of, of all that work. Um, so enter the editor's notes project. Um, so you can take a look at editor's notes if you actually want to look at the, the tool itself. It's at editorsnotes.org. Um, there's a description of the project at this ekai.org. Uh, address, including uh, some of the publications we've written about it. Um, and our aim was to provide a safe place for this kind of debris of the research that, that uh, is conducted in, in the course of doing a documentary editing project. Um, improving this return on investment, like I mentioned. Um, and we wanted really to focus on uh, so one of the, we could have t uh, approached this by, let's say, let's go in and try to digitize all the stuff that they've already done, all the notes they've already created. Um, and we didn't really want to do that, that. We wanted to focus on what would we need to do to actually change the way the editors and the researchers work together. So rather than just uh, saying, okay, we're just going to come in and digitize everything, we wanted to, to intervene in, in what they were currently researching um, and see if we could develop tools that they would find usable um, that would enable some of this stuff to be captured as it was going on rather than just digitizing it afterwards. Um, so we identified a number of, uh, early on we identified a number of principles that we wanted to follow. Um, the researchers are already overworked and un underfunded. We didn't really want to slow them down uh, any more than we had to, so a minimal amount of friction to their research project. Um, we were working with few different projects that had different work habits. We didn't want to force them all into the same exact workflow. Um, but we did want a consistency in the kind of data models that, that we used so that they could exchange information since that was one of the big motivators for this was to allow one project to use the research that another project had developed. We wanted to build on existing technology wherever possible, not try to build everything from scratch. Uh, and we wanted to adhere to, to web standards. We really felt that this uh, needed to be of the web. Um, so the underlying data model basically looks like this. Uh, there's the notes that the scholars and researchers produce. Um, notes can be divided up into individual sections. Uh, each section may cite a particular uh, document that was consulted. Um, we have metadata, bibliographic metadata about the document. There may be scans of those documents um, or tr and or transcripts uh, of the documents. The transcripts can be annotated uh, as well, so we can do some of the, the footnoting like that would end, may end up uh, in an actual published volume. Um, as, a, as, a, as a definition, notes are what the editors write 
documents of the things that the editors haven't written. Right. They're interested in. Both notes and documents are indexed by topics, uh, which may be people, places, organizations, uh, broad themes. These can be whatever uh, the, uh, the editors think is appropriate. Um, and then topics can be associated, uh, topics may have a, uh, a summary, um, sort of a summary article. This is something that they, the Emma Goldman paper does a lot, that they, they keep up to date, uh, a summary of what they know about a particular topic. Um, so that's kind of like a special note. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit in a moment about these, uh, these factoids. Uh, so here's an example uh, of the interface for adding a document. Um, as an example of building upon existing infrastructure, we interoperate with Zotero for the document metadata. Um, so even though you can enter it directly into editor's notes, um, if you have a Zotero database or a Zotero account, you can simply sync those documents um, and, uh, and not have to re-enter everything here. So we didn't, want to re we didn't want to reinvent the wheel for bibliographic metadata. Um, we use uh, a service from Microsoft called Zoomit, which allows you to, uh, uh, well, we keep the actual scans, uh, but then Microsoft provides a, an interface that allows it to be easily zoomed, uh, uh, zoomed in on. Um, <clears throat> And then the transcripts for the documents are stored in, uh, in HTML, and we have this interface to annotate passages of text. Uh, the topics, here's an example of, of entering a, a new topic. These are the primary, primary method of indexing items. Um, they're classified by type. Like I said, we can have persons or places or, or organizations. It's just a, sort of another uh, layer of organization for the topics. Um, and because topics may be created uh, by different people over time, they may not realize that a similar topic has already been created. And also because we're interested in uh, um, having a consistent taxonomy of topics across the different projects that, that want to share information. Uh, we also have an interface for clustering and merging topics that uses Google Refine. Um, so people don't, the users don't actually have to interact with Google Refine. But uh, on our server, uh, it, it talks to Google Refine and looks, uses the um, tools that Refine has available for clustering uh, similar strings and things with similar properties uh, and alerts people, says uh, you have two very similar topics here, do you want to merge those or do you not want to merge those? So it's not an automatic process because there are sometimes, um, say people, say a junior and senior uh, who have very similar names. Uh, we don't want to automatically merge those. But we just want to alert people to when, it ha when it happens. And then there's notes. And notes are the most difficult uh, part of the project. This is the part that we spent the most time iterating on, trying to come up with uh, a good way of, of modeling what notes are um, and reflect uh, editors thinking about it. Um, so notes are messy. Uh, and purposefully so. Uh, one of the, the issues we had early on is that people felt that putting their notes into a system like this made them look too polished and they didn't like that, that they, they wanted it to look, uh, the, the interface to reflect the, the messiness of their, of their thinking at the time. Um, so how do we model something that's, that's so chaotic and idiosyncratic? How do we create something that's easy to use uh, and flexible, but has enough consistency that we can share information across pro projects? Um, <clears throat> so after uh, lots of iterations, the, we, we, settled, we finally settled on something that seemed to meet the needs of the, uh, the projects that we were working with. Uh, here's the interface for uh, adding a node. And it's what I mentioned earlier is that um, nodes can have these different uh, pieces. So an individual note may be covering kind of a broad theme or a broad question, like Margaret Sanger uh, and the, uh, the third ICCP conference. Um, and but then there's the individual documents that were consulted and notes specific to those documents uh, that make up the body of this note. Um, 
And that modeling things in that way uh, enabled us to both meet the needs of this, like, the groups like the Sanger papers where it was more, their notes were more around particular research questions uh, and then all the places they had looked to try to investigate that question and what they had found um, versus the style of some other projects where it was more centered around the documents that they looked at. So where the title of their document would be more like um, uh, Margaret Sanger's letter to Pearl S. Buck and they'd basically be just be taking notes on that and then maybe using some keywords um, to, to group those together. Um, so those notes have a, a description. Um, they have some status which indicates whether or not they're being actively researched or not. Uh, so open means there's a basically a, a question that's been posed uh, but and they're still actively looking for information on it. Closed means they basically feel like they've gathered all the information they need about that topic. Hibernating means they haven't actually gathered all the information that they need, um, but they've uh, either decided to work on other things for a while, or they've reached a dead end, and uh, um, uh, so they're not willing to close it, but they just need to sort of uh, put it off to the side, uh, and that's the, the hibernating notes. Uh, they can assign users to a particular note, so if we go back to the example I was showing earlier, the editor could create the note about Lennon's brother or whether other people in his family had been jailed uh, and assign that to Patrick uh, with his initial questions there. And then Patrick could take that over, see it had been assigned to him, and add his research uh, to it. Uh, I already went over the sections. Um, and also, these notes are all, uh, are, are all stored as HTML, and every revision to them uh, is stored as well. So there's full revision history for, uh, for all the information that goes into to editor's notes. So just to show you uh, some examples here, here's one from the Margaret Sanger papers. We see this one is uh, still open. Here's the initial question. What changed as a result of uh, Sanger's trip to India? Lots of the books written later seem to describe the same situation as before Sanger went there while others say that she was uh, influential. Um, here's the actual body of the note itself, uh, where we have each document that was, uh, that was consulted, um, and then the notes that were taken on that particular document. Um, <clears throat> are, the, are the notes at a document level or to a section of the document? The, uh, the notes are at a, doc at a document level. Um, and that, that's a good question, though, because there is this issue about the, the granularity of the bibliographic metadata. Um, and that's something that came up with our integration with Zotero, is that um, they sometimes wanted to model um, uh, a, a document that they had consulted was actually a page in a scrapbook, let's say. And, it's, and Zotero doesn't necessarily provide the, the tools to model things that in that fine-grained of a way. Um, and so we actually have some ability to extend beyond the Zotero data model when it's, when it's necessary to, to add some additional properties and things like that. Um, but we can go here, uh, click on that, and get, uh, this one actually didn't come from Zotero, so it has no connected Zotero data. Um, and I'm not sure why it doesn't have any, the note, this note should be showing up there, but okay. Um, and then um, here's the topics that were used to, uh, to index this note. Uh, so basically, mostly the people that are mentioned here, but then also broad themes like women in India, birth control movements in, in India, and so on. Um, and here's the history of the note. We can see the, the revisions that, uh, that have been made. Um, a slightly different style of using editor's notes. This is from the Stanton Anthony papers. Um, they were a little bit different case because, uh, and as Mike will explain a bit more in a moment, they were a project that was in the pr process of ending. Um, so they didn't have as many active research topics. So they were using editor's notes more to, uh, to publicize uh, particular documents that they had collected. Um, 
So they've taken all these uh, test cases during reconstruction um, and scanned all the documents and made them available. Uh, and then the notes are more kind of uh, intended for public consumption rather than their, um, their internal research. Um, but we can look at filter by particular publications. Um, and here we can see an example of uh, something that we have scans for. Well, there's not much to this scan, but um, this shows the, the zooming interface and so on. And here's an example of a document that, for which a transcript has been provided, um, and there's footnotes on individual um, sentences from the transcript with some explanation. Uh, these are also modeled as notes uh, in the underlying database, but presented in a, in a different way here. Okay, so what changed is the basis of, uh, um, uh, on, of using editor's notes rather than doing things the way that uh, uh, these projects have been doing it. Um, the notes themselves changed from these totally free text documents to these uh, semi-structured blocks that could be rearranged in different ways. And this is one of the cited as one of the best benefits of using editor's notes from the projects is that uh, whereas before they had uh, even, one, even projects that, were, uh, that mainly worked digitally would basically have a single RTF file or a single Word file, and that was in one, uh, one folder in their, um, their shared server. Uh, and here they could have a, some notes about a particular document that was actually relevant to a number of different research questions, and they had the flexibility of uh, including that in different places because of the way that our database was structured. Um, that a lot of the information about the people and places and events to which some notes were relevant was implicit in their previous organization systems and here we made those uh, explicit linkable entities that uh, they could point to. Um, and most importantly from our point of view is a lot of this stuff that was stuck in these filing cabinets uh, was now openly available on the web uh, something they could, they could cite. Um, early on in this project, uh, and actually one of the things that motivated what it was, one of the editors from the Emma Goldman papers um, had some of his edits to the Emma Goldman page on Wikipedia reverted um, because he couldn't point to any sources that uh, he, could, he was citing work research that they had done for the current volume which hadn't been published yet, so he couldn't point to it and cite it. Um, now he can point to the page on editor's notes and it, because it's external and on the web, that's enough to make the, the Wikipedia editors uh, happy. Um, so the benefits, uh, these connections linking topics are freed uh, from the minds of the editors and the researchers and are, are indexed and made available for anyone to see. Um, these standardized records of the work can easily be uh, revisited from, out, from within a project or from outside, so a lot of the the usefulness was just there's high turnover in these research assistants and they could really quickly come up to speed rather than just having to wait until somebody told them about, oh, it's in that box over there. Um, it's a new way of seeing some of the, the, the kind of uh, outer edges of humanities research, so well, the, the, the work that actually goes into producing these, these published volumes. Um, and uh, it's also evidence of the work that's actually going on in these projects, also important from a kind of PR funding point of view for a lot of these, uh, for a, a project, it's like, well, your last volume came out uh, eight years ago, what have you guys been doing? And you can actually say, uh, point to, well, there's, we've been doing a lot. Um, and then the system itself, uh, the, the source code is all available on GitHub. Uh, it's built uh, all using uh, open source technologies, uh, the Django web framework, um, the data is all stored in a Postgres uh, database using its ability to store uh, XML. We actually store XHTML for all the documents. Um, we use Haystack for our uh, full text searching. I mentioned Zotero and Google Refine. Um, and when we opened up to the public and allowing other people to create accounts, we started using 
Mozilla Persona for ID management, um, which I highly recommend. It's a very nice way to avoid having to uh, keep passwords and, and personal information about uh, users, um, but not require them to use a Facebook or Google or other privacy invading method of logging into your tools. Their personal information is actually stored in their browser. Um, and yet, they can still get the kind of one password uh, um, login to, to sites. Were you uh, registered as authoritative for the domain, or are you just pointing people back to Mozilla as the authoritative site for Persona? Um, I am not the person who actually implemented this, so I'm, I'm not sure if I can actually answer that question. But uh, uh, so, P uh, Patrick Golden, who's our uh, lead developer right now, uh, could answer that question. But from the point of view of the end user, um, they click on a button on our site and it pops up a window which has the, uh, which is from Mozilla. But then it is storing information in your browser. So like when I sign on, I get, it's, it stores it in the, uh, the local database. And um, so I'm not sure about all the different models that, uh, and, and how exactly that, uh, that works. But it's, it's worked pretty nicely for us. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so looking forward to what we're planning to do for at least the, the next two years. Um, so there was a lot of desired enhancements that came up in the process of, of getting to where we are now. Uh, one of the things was there was a desire for better sorting and filtering and aggregating of notes uh, beyond what we can currently uh, allow. Um, there was a uh, desire for, we have, I mentioned a little bit of the, uh, the naming control in terms of the, the clustering and merging of topics, um, uh, but also making things discoverable in other kinds of contexts. So uh, if somebody has uh, uh, an archival finding aid that's mentioning some of these people, making it easier to integrate maybe some of the interesting related uh, notes that have been taken about the people mentioned in that finding aid. Um, and then also wanting to have these cool temporal and geospatial and relational visualizations of the, the research data that was being collected. Um, and all of these things pointed to a need for more structured data. So a lot of the reason we couldn't um, provide the uh, enhanced sorting, sorting and filtering of things was that the editors wanted to enter everything uh, as free text. They didn't want to fill out forms, and yet if we didn't have that structure, uh, it made it a lot harder to do those sorts of things. So there's kind of three basic approaches uh, for adding structured data to these semi-structured documents. One, which was a non-starter for us, was uh, forcing kind of more schema-based authoring, um, basically filling out more form-like interfaces, and, and for these kinds of messy notes, the, the, the editors don't really want to do that. Um, another possibility is that we do some kind of trying to automatically enhance the, these textual documents with, with metadata, so using some, some information extraction uh, software to try to identify named entities and reconcile them uh, automatically. And uh, that can work pretty well, but not when you have people who are really picky about things being right. Um, <clears throat> so if you're willing to accept uh, mistakes and, uh, and bad data, um, then that can, that can work okay. But um, again, we found that this was not uh, something that, that uh, our users can be happy with. Um, uh, but something we did want to experiment with was human in the loop reconciliation of topics that were being researched to external data sets where we could import structured data that other people had been producing, uh, particularly um, from the library community, uh, also sources like Wikipedia, um, and we're hoping going forward also from more and more from archives. Um, so we started experimenting with linking our topics to external things like the Virtual International Authority file, DBpedia, the, uh, the Deutsche National Bibliothek uh, information about uh, people and things they've done with that, um, 
British National Biography, so all these, these emerging sources of, of linked data. Um, so an early uh, experiment in this vein, uh, we developed this linked data harvester that where we basically, as people created topics, we'd send their topic names uh, to uh, um, uh, a service called Same As, which would then return uh, candidate URIs uh, for, each, for each of our topic names. Um, and then we would go and uh, uh, get representations of those of candidate URIs um, from these various sources and uh, basically harvest a bunch of assertions that have been made about, say, Emma Goldman in these various sources. So we get back all these, uh, these statements. Um, and we would actually separately store in separate graphs the information we got from different sources. Uh, and then we provided an interface to the editors um, where they could see the uh, assertions that had been harvested and basically accept them or reject them. Um, and they could do that either at an individual assertion level, um, they could do it at a property level, saying this is a property that I don't really care about, so don't show me this anymore, uh, or at a whole source level, like uh, uh, you know, Freebase has terrible information, don't show me Freebase anymore, don't show me Freebase anymore as it relates to, to Emma Goldman. Um, so that was a, a pilot project that we did uh, kind of in, in, in trying to actually be a, a consumer uh, of linked data. Um, and we learned that it was possible to build this system to automatically harvest these, this relevant linked data. Um, and that we could provide this interface for interacting with it. Um, but we also found that this editorial control needed to be better integrated into the note taking process so that people uh, it violated uh, our principle of not adding friction by having this extra thing to do where you go in and accept or reject statements. Um, we also didn't adequately demonstrate why you would want to do this. Um, we started out with collecting data rather than immediately trying to, to add some of the benefits that, uh, that I mentioned uh, of having structured data. Um, so we decided that when, to do this properly, we needed to not just aggregate and edit the linked data, but really try to usefully uh, exploit it. Um, so in our, our, what we're currently working on um, is trying to address some of those issues. So having in-process reconciliation where rather than separately creating topics and then later reconciling them in this uh, in separate batch process, um, that editors are creating and linking to and reconciling topics as they take notes. I'm sure we're trying to make interfaces that are making that easier to do. Um, and then, most importantly, motivating this structured data use, um, enabling them to, uh, well, well and whereas before we were just enabling them to store and edit the data, but not really providing any incentive for them to do so, um, now we're trying to uh, have a system in which they immediately get new abilities to sort and filter their data or to create simple visualizations by doing this. So there's immediate payoff uh, for linking to structured data. Um, so we already, where we do have structured data is the bibliographic metadata that we have. Uh, and so we already uh, provide tools for sorting and filtering based on, on that data. Um, and now what we plan to do is extend that uh, so we can filter and sort notes not only using the dates of the cited documents, but information like the locations and birth and death dates of the people referenced in the notes, locations and dates of the existence of the organizations, locations and dates of the events that are referenced. Um, in terms of visualization, so this is an example of sort of a side project that we did um, where we created a visualization based on notes from the Emma Goldman project where they maintain an internal chronology of where Emma Goldman was uh, on each day, um, and we would link those to documents that they had scans of, um, and then we gave you the ability to narrow down on a timeline and, and uh, search on a map uh, to see particular places that she had been and, and follow her travels. Um, and this entire uh, document is actually all uh, uh, a self-contained um, 
graph of, of linked data. It's all RDFA embedded in a single page there, and then the JavaScript interface for, for interacting with it. Um, so the editors really liked that. They wanted to do more things like this, but it was a lot of work just creating it for this one chronological document. So that's the, uh, the kind of thing that we want to make easily available, um, but for any of the, the note-related data. So a note on Rama Rao and the fourth International Conference on Planned Parenthood is no longer, uh, we, we want it to no longer just be uh, available as a textual note, but also visible as a map of the specific locations in Stockholm and Bombay that are mentioned in the note, uh, a timeline of dates associated with the conference, a uh, network of relationships among the, the people and organizations <laughs> in the conference. Um, so basically any topic which has geographic coordinates we can map any topic that has time points or ranges uh, can be put on a timeline. Any relationships among topics can be visualized as a network. Um, and we expect the benefits of this. We hope that these, the, the working notes will become more repurpose, repurposable, um, that they're not just things that uh, we can read, but we can actually feed them into uh, these visualization tools. Um, they can become more discoverable because we've linked our topics to standard identifiers for things, so it becomes a lot easier for somebody else to come along and query uh, these repositories of notes for everything that's relevant to uh, a particular topic. Um, and the last thing is shifting the focus of these projects from the one-shot product, the edited volume, to this continuous data curation process. So to really uh, 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 see the projects more as the, this continuous uh, uh, production of and collecting data from archives and adding to it and enhancing it and, then, and, uh, and making it available again. I think we're almost on a time, but that's the, uh, the last um, kind of piece of the puzzle here is what happens when these projects end and can we build systems that continue to be available for others to pick up even once the, the funding is no longer available? And that's the, the hibernating scholarship avail, uh, um, idea that maybe we have a, a minute or two to discuss. Well, I'll just do a, a minute or two. Uh, in addition to all that, the editors found their editorial projects easier to manage with this because they could tell who had got, made how much progress with what. It's also the case that curators of special library collections have a similar knowledge and could make similar notes about the documents in their collection, and we experimented with that. And we, it's also true that archivists, professional archivists, know a lot about the documents under their care, and they can, could do a similar sort of thing, and we hope to explore that with the California State Archives. In the second phase, which started this week, um, in addition to trying to explore what archivists could do, um, and the, what Ryan has just been describing, which I would describe in the following way. If you go to a big digital humanities conference, you get these pro presentations of really expert people who've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars <coughs> developing some really spiffy visualization. How can you get some version of that functionality down to the level of these poor people who are working so hard and are not about to take the time to learn much? Uh, that's driving what Ryan was talking about. But the hibernating scholarship issue is this. Nobody seems to know what happens to these editor's notes when the projects end. The granting agencies, they give a grant to produce the manuscript for a publication. The moment the manuscript for the last volume goes to the press, the staff are laid off. Period. Seriously, this is a soft money business. And uh, if it's a founding father or a president, then probably the project will be sustained and the records will be sustained. And most editorial projects are not that. Right now, well, last September, the joint uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton Susan B. Anthony project at Rutgers ended after 25 years of a large, well managed project. Okay? Manuscript went to the press in last September, and that was what the, grant, the final grant was for. The staff were laid off. 
There was no discussion as to what to do with the large room full of all the kinds of material that were in the image. Not even any discussion. The only thing that was certain is that the dean who owned the space was going to want it back. Um, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> uh, their notes included extremely detailed step-by-step -step notes on everything that had to do with every attempt to get votes for women in each state. Those records are not in the published documents and they don't exist any other place. It's a terrible waste. So a major part of the second phase is in the first year to work with Rutgers. With that project's now been put under the School of Communication and Information, fortunately, to do archival processing so it's a ready-to-shove archive. And the lessons learned in doing that uh, will then be put into the work practices at Elmer Goldman and Margaret Sang. This is project is a professional work practices issue, very much. That's why it has to be done slowly. But it raises interesting questions about the relationship between the eventual published volumes and the research that's been going on. In effect, what has happened by Savers HTML and putting on the website, the boundary of what's published and what's not published has been moved, you see, so those expensive eventual printed editions are not the sum total of what's published because the editor's notes are published too, including the problems they can't solve. It's like the 19th century notes and queries genre, reinvented. And projects end, but scholarship goes on. And not only can they look forward to that frustrated, obsessive local historian in Possum Creek who has the membership list of the Emma Goldman Admiration Society uh, in 1895 and doesn't know anybody interested enough to share it with. Um, but it invites a 180 degrees turnaround on the relationship between the published volumes and the working notes. Because I think the implication is that instead of the working, the eventual published editions being the sole and only product, which it is now, Instead, they should be seen as intermittent, desirable byproducts of an ongoing workshop defined as the working notes and the expertise. It's what I like to call the sleeping beauty mode of archives. That is to say, if Prince Charming comes along with another grant, that work can come to life and be continued. Now, this isn't exactly conventional archiving which produces a static collection. It's somewhere between an archive, a conventional archive, a library special collection, and uh, I'm not quite sure what else. And that's a really interesting part of what we're going to address in the next. Thank you very much. Uh, we're stopping you from your reception.